Good. Glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, we are uh, going to finish up our conversation today uh, looking at songs of Christmas, looking at some of the well-known Christmas carols. Today, if you have a bulletin, you know this already, right? We're looking at Away in the Manger. Uh, again, quickly, I want to just mention this to you, what's coming next year. Uh, we are going to work our way through collectively, as a church, work our way through the New Te- or not the New Testament only, the whole Bible, chronologically. And so, uh, again, in a couple weeks, we're going to have a lot more information for you as far as reading plans and, and what groups are going to be studying through this as well. We're going to be preaching chronologically through the Bible as well. And so, uh, kind of everything is going to be focused on this for, for the year 2023. We're excited to just dive into Scripture and, and look at God's story uh, from start to finish. So, be looking for that coming up. So today, uh, we're going to dive into this. We're going to look at some truth from away in a manger. This song, uh, I think everybody probably knows, right? Like we le- learned this song as a kid, whether or not we really went to church or not. We just, we just know this song. It's rooted in our earliest child memories. Uh, in this song, there is a phrase that really that phrase we are going to talk about this morning and the implications and the aspects of that phrase. Uh, over and over and over again in this song, we see the phrase, little Lord Jesus, little Lord Jesus, uh, throughout this song. Now, it, when, we're, when we're thinking about this song and we're thinking about Jesus and how he's represented in this song, I got to be honest, just talking about Jesus in terms of like an eight-pound baby it does not really uh, give Jesus, I think, the credit that he deserves, right? He, we're we're kind of doing him a disservice because he is so much more than just a, a little baby there. He's so much more than that. And so today, we really want to focus on what the lordship of Jesus looks like, what the lordship of Jesus look, looks like, and ultimately, what, what, what we are called to do as, as a response to the lordship uh, of Jesus, and so that's what we want to talk about this morning. Uh, I'm going to pray for us uh, before we get into this, and then we are going to dive right in. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, again, we're just so thankful uh, that we get the opportunity to gather to worship you, to open your word this morning, God. Uh, my prayer is that uh, you would just be speaking to us, that uh, you would use this time as challenging, as convicting, as encouraging to us, God, uh, whatever, uh, whatever we Whatever you need to do in our hearts and in our lives, God, we just pray that we would have ears to hear that uh, and eyes to see that, God, and then give us the strength and the courage to follow wherever you uh, desire to lead us. And so, uh, God, I just pray that you do that work in our lives this morning. Uh, We thank you for everything that you've done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over and over in the New Testament, the idea of Jesus being Lord is, is said to us. In fact, uh, 740 times in the New Testament alone, this idea of Jesus being Lord is stated. That is a lot, (laughs) right? So the idea that Jesus is Lord should not be a foreign concept to any of us who have spent any amount of time in the New Testament. Uh, In Luke chapter 2, we, we, we see some of the earliest references in the New Testament to Jesus' lordship. And again, this is the, this is the Christmas story, uh, and we've read this several times over the last several weeks. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 10, this is the angels coming to the shepherds here, and, and it says, the angels said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, a Savior who is Messiah the who? The Lord, right? Who is Messiah the Lord was born for you in the city of David. He is Christ the Lord. He is Savior of the world. So then the question really is that we want to deal with this morning. The question is, what does it mean to us or for us that Jesus is Lord? Like, what, how does that really translate into our lives? How does that really work its way into our lives? What does that mean? If Jesus is Lord, what does it mean? And, and what does that mean in, in all the areas of our lives? If we're married, what does it mean for Jesus to be Lord, right? If we're a student, what does it mean for Jesus to be Lord? Uh, if, we're, if we're in Walmart shopping, 
What does it mean for Jesus to be Lord, right? I had this last week. If we're in Denver driving, what does it mean for Jesus to be Lord? In all contexts, in all areas of our lives, what does it mean for Jesus to be Lord? There's a Greek word that represents Jesus' lordship. We translate it into English and get the word Lord. The Greek word is kurios, kurios. And this word means supreme in authority, controller, and Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but this idea of controller, that kind of gets my attention a little bit. You? Right? I think it can for many of us. I think some of us, this idea of Jesus being the controller maybe can rub us wrong because in reality, we may not say this out loud, but in reality, you are the controller of your world. Like in the, in the areas of your life, in your job, in your family, in all of those things, right, you are the controller, not anybody else, right? You are the one who's, who's calling the shots. And, and controllers, controllers struggle with the idea of somebody else controlling, right? We just do. Now, I'm not, I'm not a controller. I'm not a control freak. I'm really good with everybody doing their own thing as long as it goes the way that I want it to go, <laughs> Right? Some of you, I think, if we're honest, can relate to that, right? Like, we're, we wouldn't ca- call ourselves control freaks until things don't go or things don't end up the way that we want them to. And so, what does it mean when it says Jesus is Lord? What does it mean when it says Jesus is supreme in authority? What does it mean when it, when it says Jesus is controller? Well, being technical here for just a moment, um, we don't make Jesus Lord, okay? We just don't, Right? Why? Because we don't have that ability to. We don't. We don't have the ability to. Uh, God made Jesus Lord a long time ago, right? God made Jesus Lord. We don't make Him Lord. We surrender to Him, right? We give ourselves over to Him. We surrender to His already established Lordship, but Matt Snyder does not make Jesus Lord. I don't have that authority, right? I don't have that power. We don't, we don't turn over control to Him. He's already really got it. So, what does it look like for us to turn over, what does it look like for us, excuse me, to surrender to the Lordship of Christ? How do we do this? Well, ultimately, I think it lands us at a couple different areas of application here. I think there's really two options. If we're going to go down this path of surrendering to Jesus, I really think there's only two options that we can have in our surrender to Jesus. The first option is this, we can live out the partially surrendered life. We can live out the partially surrendered life. I think this, honestly, if we're being honest, this is where the majority of American Christians exist. This is where the majority of, of, of Christians in this country live. It is casual Christianity. It is cultural Christianity, right? It is, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to pick and choose what I want to follow, right? It, this, is, this is kind of the, the, the identity of Christianity in our country, and it sounds something like this. We say we believe in Jesus. We maybe even say the words, we believe that He is Lord of our lives, but we live our lives uh, in a way that, that says something otherwise, right? We say the words, Jesus is Lord, but our lives show something different. They demonstrate something different. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus is talking about the wise and foolish builders, and, and, and in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus says these words. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? Why do you say with your mouth, Lord, Lord, but you ignore the things that I actually tell you? Why are you giving me lip service without walking the walk? Why are you calling me Lord and then doing ultimately whatever you want to do in your life. Unfortunately, today, I think that most of us fall into this, at least in, at times and in seasons of our lives. I think most of us can identify with this, right? Where we say, I believe Jesus is Lord, but I'm going to control my own life. I believe Jesus is Lord, but I'm going to do the things that I want to do. I'm going to pick and choose the things Jesus says that I actually want to follow in my life. I believe Jesus is Lord, but I'm not going to trust him with everything in my life. I believe Jesus is Lord, but I'm not going to surrender everything, right? I'm going to hold on to some of these areas. And so, you know, we take the Bible and then we say things like, I know Jesus calls us to, to, to pray for and to forgive those who have hurt us, 
right? The, the Bible says for us to, to forgive as we have been forgiven, but I'm not going to do that because I got hurt by somebody and I want to hold on to the grudge. We do this, right? Or, or we, we say things like, I know, I know Scripture is clear about how we're, we're to raise up our children, how we're to rear up and disciple our kids, but that's a lot of work and I'm really busy and it doesn't fit into my schedule, and that's ultimately why I send them to, to children's ministry and church. And so I'm going to just let the church do that. Or, or, we, or we do things like, or we say things like, I know Jesus talks about engaging in the mission of making disciples around me, but, but I don't really like people that much. Okay, I'm just saying what you know is being thought sometimes, okay? <laughs> you laugh because you know it's true. Okay, I, I don't really like people that much, and it seems like a big risk, right? Like I've been hurt before, and so I'm just not going to, I'm not going to do that either. We pick and choose the parts that Jesus calls us to, that we want and that we don't want. We're a partially committed, partially surrendered follower of Jesus. Jesus says, don't call me Lord and then ignore the things that I say and go do whatever you want to do. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Many of us know this passage. Uh, This is a foundational popular passage for believers. Here's a version you might like. I don't know if you've heard this version or not. It's from the uh, the the version PSV. It's the partially surrendered version. It it goes like this. I think we have it up here. Uh, Trust in the Lord with some of your heart. Lean on your own understanding. Uh, In some of your ways, acknowledge Him, and you can make your own paths straight. Here's the thing. Some of us are living this way, right? Some of us, this is us. This is how ultimately, not by the words that we necessarily say, but the lives that we live, this is how we view it, right? This is how we view it. Now, now, this is obviously not a real Bible translation, okay? You cannot go look this up. (laughs) But it's a real way that many of us live our lives. And the reality is is that Jesus is no part-time Lord, Right? Jesus is no part-time Lord, and he doesn't call part-time followers. Okay? Jesus has some, some strong statements to say, to make, uh, uh, about who he calls, how he calls us to live our lives, and what happens if we are just kind of casually committed. Okay? Here's a couple examples. Matthew chapter 16. This is Jesus calling the disciples. Matthew 16 verse 24 says, If anyone is to come with me, he must deny himself take up his cross and follow me, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. What will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his life, or what will a man give in exchange for his life? So Jesus has very strong statements about this is what it looks like to follow me. You give of everything, right? You, you deny yourself completely and follow me. But then Jesus also, on the flip side, has a strong response for for those who are complacent in their life, for the ones who are just kind of going through the motions, right? We read this in Revelation chapter 5. This is is the words to the church in Laodicea. Many of us know this, right? Uh, Jesus says, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were you, I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's an image for you, right? I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because you say, I'm rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't know that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus has some strong statements to make about what it looks like to follow him and what it looks like if we are not, if we're not living the life that he calls us to live, right? If we're just complacent in our lives. So when we surrender to Jesus, when we come, o- come under the supreme authority of Jesus that, that's already established, right? Like Jesus' lordship is already there. We're just coming under it. We do not decide it. We do not dictate anything to him. We follow him. We submit to him. And really, ultimately, what it looks like is that Jesus surrendered everything on the cross for us, and so our response should be to do the same for Him. Our response should be to surrender to Him, to come under His lordship, to come under His control, to come under His direction in our life and submit to that. That's what He calls us to in our lives. So, let us 
prayerfully and honestly ask then this question of ourselves, what have I not surrendered to Jesus? What have I not surrendered to Jesus? What area or areas of my life am I still trying to control? What areas of of my life am I not giving up to Jesus? What areas of my life am I not following Jesus wherever he directs me or calls me or leads me? Like maybe it's our kids. I think this is a hard one for parents. Like maybe it's our kids because we want to at some level kind of direct and control the future of our kids. And when we hand that over to Jesus, we don't know where that's going to lead. Right? We can't manipulate that all the time. We can't control that all the time. We don't know where our kids are going to ultimately end up. That's a hard one to let control to Jesus over to. If it's not our kids, maybe it's our future, right? We want to we wanna have certain outcomes in our lives. We want to end up as, at a certain place. We want to ha- reach certain goals in our lives. And, and sometimes when we give Jesus control of our lives, he takes us in directions that we were not planning on going that ultimately lead to different outcomes. Or, or maybe it's not even that. Maybe it's our relationships, right? Maybe we, maybe we just will not listen to the Holy Spirit's guiding in our lives concerning relationships. And we say, well, I really love them, or I'm going to change them, or God wants me to be happy and feel loved, and that's what this person, you know, whatever it is, right? When in reality, Jesus is calling us to do something different. What have I not surrendered in my life to Jesus? What have I not surrendered? Almost all of us in some way, in some form, are living a partially surrendered life to Jesus. Now, there's another level. There's another level. And the second level is this. It is the fully surrendered life. The fully surrendered life to Jesus. This is not the casual, every once in a while, Sunday Christian. This is not the Easter and Christmas attender Christian. This is not the I show up when it's convenient Christian. We are talking about an all-in, completely surrendered, completely following Jesus. My life belongs to God, follower of Jesus. Romans chapter 14, starting verse 7, Paul says, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. No matter if we live, no matter if we die, no matter what we have going on, we belong to God. We belong to the Lord. When Jesus offers us salvation, when Jesus offers us salvation, when we say yes to that, to that salvation, it costs us everything. It costs us everything. It costs us our lives, right? We are no longer the controller of our lives. It costs us all aspects of our lives, uh, and our lives belong to God, not ourselves. And so then the, the correct translation of Proverbs chapter 3 that we read earlier, right? Not the, not the partially surrendered version, but rather maybe this version uh, says this, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, right? Trust in the Lord with all of heart, your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. Think about Him in all of your ways and He will guide you on the right paths. That sounds a little bit more um, familiar to us, doesn't it? The question is, are we living it? Are we living it? The reason why so many of us do not surrender our lives to God in areas is because we do not know God in those areas very well. We don't know God in these areas. Think about Him. The passage says, think about Him in all your ways. Know Him in all your ways. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. The areas that we hold on to control of, the areas that we hold on to lordship of in our lives lives are often the areas that we have not allowed God to speak into in our lives. It's the areas that, that show us that we don't know God very well in those areas. So to know God is to trust and surrender to Him And God sent to us Jesus. And what we celebrate this season is God sending Jesus to us in the flesh, right? As a a human being, right? And so uh, God sent Jesus to us to give us an opportunity to know Him better, to be relational with Him so that we can know Him, so we can experience things 
with Him. So, when we're holding on to control in our lives in certain areas, maybe it's our finances, or our relationships, maybe it's our time, our kids, whatever it is, right, our futures, whatever it is, when we're holding on to control in these areas, but we seek out intimacy with God in these areas. God, show me really what it looks like for me to parent my kids. God, show me really what it looks like to have relationships with people outside the church. God, show me what it looks like to manage my finances the way that you desire for me to manage my finances. When we seek out intimacy with God in these areas, when we seek out Scripture, when we pray through it, when we seek seek godly counsel in these areas... We are allowing God to change our hearts in these areas, and we come underneath His Lordship and His direction in all of these areas. The tragedy is that so many people, so many American Christians are under some kind of illusion that that you're good if you just show up every once in a while and check off some boxes. Like we're under some illusion that if I just come and I sit in a seat and maybe throw a few bucks in, like that's, that's all I'm supposed to do. That's all I'm called to do. Or we, we come and maybe we attend a, a study every once in a while when it's convenient and we check off a box or maybe we, maybe we serve every couple months and we check off a box, whatever it is, right? Or, or maybe we have convinced ourselves that since I have been coming and sitting in a seat every Sunday morning for all of my life, that means that I'm good. When in reality, I think that's furthest from the truth. This is what, Ma- what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus says, Not everyone who comes to me saying, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That should cause us at least to pause for a moment. That should cause us at least to pause, to take a, a second, a moment, and ask the question, am I the one who is simply coming to Jesus saying, Lord, Lord? He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we, didn't we drive out demons in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we do miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. This should at least cause us to take a moment and ask, is this me? Is this me? Is this the life that I am living? Jesus says, I never knew you. We didn't have a relationship. You did stuff using my name, but we we didn't know each other here. We didn't have a relationship here. You just gave me lip service. You just went through the motions but, you, but never became who I desired for you to become, and you never did what I desired for you to do. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There is a difference between being a committed follower, a committed disciple of Jesus. There is a difference between that individual and just calling yourself a Christian in name only. So, The question is, are you living the partially or the fully surrendered life to Jesus? What life are you living? What life are you living? And and I get it, right? Like you came here this morning, it's a week before Christmas, right? Matt, why can't you just talk about like happy, joyful, cheerful things, right? Why do you got to hammer on us? Why do you got to, why do you got to be hard on us? Well, here's why. Here's why. Because if looking at the birth of Jesus doesn't springboard into a deeper conversation about the reason why Jesus came to this earth, then why are we having the conversation to begin with? I mean, really, if we talk about Christmas just in very, very high-level terms with no boots-on-the-ground application, if we just talk about Christmas in terms of how it makes us feel good and warm and cheerful without actually talking about what He came to do on this earth, why are we even having the conversation to begin with? Because the reality is, and we said it a few weeks ago, right, the birth of Jesus has no significance if Easter didn't happen. And Jesus left His high place. Jesus left His throne his power, 
his position in heaven. He came to become a man on this earth. He walked with us. He lived with us, right? He experienced things with us, and he went to the cross to take the penalty of our sin, right? Not some hypothetical person's sin 2,000 years ago. Your sin, my sin, our sin. He did that for us. He gave up everything for us. And we can accept that from Him. Our response should be then to give everything back to Him. Our response should be to surrender to His Lordship, to surrender to His, lead, to his leading, to raise up that white flag of surrender, right? That, that we allow Him control and Lordship over all parts of our lives, not just the areas that we pick and choose we, we, what we want to give to Him. Jesus calls us to surrender everything to Him. Later on in the song, Away in the Manger, the lyrics go like this. You know it. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Do we really know what we are singing here? I mean, do we really understand the, what these words mean? Do we really know that when we sing these words, or what, when we're asking these words, do we really understand that fitting us for heaven, what that really means? It means keeping our eyes on Jesus, right? It means following Him. It means letting Him mold us and shape us and turn us into who He desires for us to be, not who we desire for us to be. Do we really understand that fit us for heaven can't happen unless we surrender our lives to him completely. Partially or fully surrendered. What are you going to choose this Christmas? Heavenly Father, God, we're so thankful for what we get to celebrate this year. So thankful that we get to take uh, a season of our year and, and pause and have conversations about Jesus' birth to celebrate, to have parties and gatherings and, um, and, and sing special songs and, and do all of these things, God. We're so thankful for those times. We're thankful for these opportunities. But God, above everything else, pray that we would not use this simply as a, as a time to stop having hard conversations Pray that we would not use these times as, as opportunities to not have difficult conversations about, about who we are, about what you have called us to do and to be in our lives, God. Because ultimately, again, we're so thankful for what Jesus did on the cross for us. And Christmas has no purpose. It has no significance if Easter never happened. And so, God, for each one of us, I just pray that you would be stirring in us, that you would be working these things up in us, that we would be asking these questions, that we would be honestly taking a look at our lives and asking, am I partially committed? Am I partially surrendered? Am I fully surrendered, God? We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for everything that he did for us, God. My prayer, our prayer, let it be that because he surrendered everything, we can surrender everything to him. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so again,